zucchini kraut. People don't talk about it. It is delicious. Um, and it is, zucchini kraut is a lesson in impermanence. It takes three days, it lasts three days. Um, we have a big jar of it, and I'm like, okay, the clock starts now. Everybody eat. <laughs> we have lots of other krauts. They will last. This will not last. It'll just go really, really soggy. Um, even if you have small zucchinis like this one, um, which do tend to be a little firmer, um, or the larger ones, it will really only last three days. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll last a little bit longer if you stick it in the fridge. Um, but it still will go. But anyway, I thought I'd just go through the process of how to make it today. So, again, this was picked today. Um, can everybody see what I'm doing? Okay, so, grater. Uh, ordinarily, I don't grate it. I've got a, a hand mooly. You can do it in the food processor if you've got, um, or you can grate them. So for mooly for us, uh, I've got a, uh, an unscored five-year-old and anything that moves and anything that he can be engaged in um, is a toy for him. Uh, so I tend to save all the mooling and things like that, juicing and food processing for when he needs an activity to do. So sauerkraut, I started krauting uh, about seven years ago and I started doing cabbage after I read that Grassroots magazine and I thought, right, I'm going to... I'm going to, if, if sand or cats can keep HIV, is AIDS away, then I can keep the common cold away. <laughs> so I'll see how I go. So it started from there. I made sauerkraut once very successfully, and the next week I was at our local neighbourhood centre taking a very large workshop of how to make it. Um, because people were just saying, wow, you made sauerkraut, how do we do that? And my grandmother used to make it. And... Um, a note about cleanliness and sterilisation. Um, I don't really sterilise, unless I'm preserving fruit for a very long time and I need it to be cellar stable, um, I won't sterilise, um, but I will wash with very, very hot soapy water. Um, and we heat our water at home with, um, with our fire. So whenever, sometimes we don't light the fire, especially in the summer for four or five days, so it's kind of hot but as hot as I can make it, um, soapy water. Um, okay. So also at home, because uh, we always have a lot of people living with us, um, I tend not to um, preserve in, or make krauts and ferment in small, in small jars. I do big, in big crocks. Um, and then when it's finished, then I put it into jars because I'm just fermenting a lot. And I've got a table it's probably about from the end to here um, in our kitchen called the fermenting table um, and it's got all my crocs and jars and vats and things just sort of bubbling away because I find that if, I, if they're not right there, pardon me, um, then I'll forget about them because some of them need to be burped and by burped I mean just to release the carbon dioxide, you just lift the lid. It's not a term that I made up but I really like it. Um, and our fermenting table is the centre of our home and I feel like an alchemist when I'm there lifting up lids and checking on things. Okay, so for every, I don't know, what's that? Like two centimetres? So I'll put two centimetres of the zucchini and then some salt. Uh, so this is Pink Lake salt. Uh, we have a really fantastic food co-op in Dalesford where we're able to buy things in bulk. Um, Non-iodised salt. Um, so people use kosher pickling salt, I know that's a big one, but I feel like we're lucky here in this region. We've got Murray salt, we've got Pink Lake salt. Um, you can use um, the Himalayan salt. Um, if you do buy rock salt, it's great to uh, mortar and pestle or put in your coffee grinder just to make it really fine. Um, you can also just dilute it a little bit um, if you don't have a mortar and pestle or any way to grind the salt. So you can just dilute in a little bit of water um, and then pour it on if you like. But um, so just a sprinkle, I don't know what that is, it's maybe like half a teaspoon, maybe, just on the top, and then just keep adding. So when we make kraut, the whole process of krauting is an anaerobic process. So it, it takes place without oxygen. So the aim is to, whatever happens under the liquid, and we'll talk about that in a second, 
that's where the fermenting happens. So some ferments are open ferments um, and some are closed ferments. And this is a, this is a closed. So, by, well, at home I just put a, when I do it in a crock, I just have a, um, like a pillowcase or a tea towel over the top of the crock, um, but the action happens underneath the liquid. So it's still called a closed ferment, even though it might be open to the, open to the microbes. Does anyone else want to have a look at wild fermentation? Okay, so Sandor Katz a couple of years ago put out another fantastic book called The Art of, no, yeah, The Art of Fermentation. Um, and that's an encyclopedia style uh, book and it's fantastic. So this is more recipes, um, although the recipes that he uses, uh, a little pinch of this and a little bit of that, they're not very specific. Um, and so he's really um, led the revival of fermentation. So when people talk about how trendy it is now, blame that guy. Black moulds, green moulds, scoop it off. Red mould, I've never seen a red mould on any of my ferments, but apparently red mould, you chuck it out. I haven't had that. Um, again, just go by smell. And I also like to taste my ferments every day, every second day. I just like to have a peek how they're going. Um, and have a relationship with them. I think in our society we have been so frightened of microbes and, and so frightened of bacteria that we, we're like, oh, what, what's it doing now? And is it ready and I'm too scared to taste it? Get in there, go for it, <laughs> see how you go. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you can, actually you can make these ferments without salt at all. They just won't last as long. So the aim of fermentation is to, we have death over here, we have life over here, um, and it's to preserve the vegetables at just the right moment of decay before they tip a little bit too close to death. So you can, so as our 15 year old says, it's basically zombie food, because it's halfway between life and death. <laughs> um, but you can, um, yeah, you can do it without salt. Yeah. It just won't last as long. Yeah. So as long as, so what I'm about to show, as long as the solid is underneath the liquid, then that'll be fine. Um, so that's that zucchini. So I'm just putting some grape leaves on the top. Um, so this is called a follower. So I'm using this as a follower. And if I push down, can you see here that it's already, the liquid has already started to come up? So by the end of today, even by the end of this workshop, the, the line of liquid will be quite high. Um, so at home, I will have a, oh, that one fit, this fit. Yeah, this will fit. So if I just push down, I'll just put a jar with some water in it or some rocks or something. And every time I pass, I'll push down to release the, the oxygen from the liquid. Because if there is um, a bacteria that we don't want, it's going to be caught up in a little air bubble here. So because it's anaerobic, you just want to get rid of all of that oxygen. Um, so I, I thought that this would be a bit higher. I bought a little shot glass, thinking that I could just push that down. So, but that'll be fine. That'll be, by the, by the end of the workshop, that'll be fine. So did everybody have a taste? Yeah, good, huh? Often if I've got a ferment going and I'm not, if the vegetables are a little bit old or I'm not quite sure how it's going, I'll take some liquid from a previous batch and just put a little bit in there to try to cultivate those same microbes because it's, yeah, I'm just trying, like, a, um, like you do with a bit of sourdough starter or a bit of yogurt starter. Uh, so what's happening is um, that we are trying to feed our gut bacteria. Um, and the gut bacteria, people who are in Patrick's talk and people who have done a little bit of research or ever been on Facebook, Facebook because it feels like everybody's sharing this stuff at the moment, um, is just the link between gut health and bodily health, really. So it's definitely gut-brain health and gut-brain relationship to do with our moods, to do with our sleep, to do with our general well-being. The, the, you, you're, you need to put food into your gut that your, the good bacteria can feed on. So you need... Fiber. You need a whole food diet for optimum health. You need a whole food diet and and as well as fermented foods. Yeah, the fiber acts like a substrate. The other thing I meant to say in my talk was that the microbiome regulates almost, I think, all of the um, physiological systems in the body. The immune system, the nervous system. It has its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. So the microbiome is sort of almost like the centre of, of, of the human body. Um, so the cooler a ferment is while it's fermenting, the longer it will last. 
So while it's fermenting, um, you want to just keep it in your kitchen or if it's too hot, just in a, in a cool place in, in your house, a cool cupboard maybe. And as soon as it hits that point of where everything's fermented and it's just perfect, it's just zinging, you taste it and think, la, you want to cool it down to stop it there, right there. So in the fridge, we've got a cellar, so I've got lots of jars in our cellar. Um, yeah, that's, that's the first thing. Um, second thing about light, um, I, I tend to put a cloth over all of my ferments. Again, I generally don't ferment in glass. I'll do it in a crock, which is ceramic um, or stoneware. Um, yeah, I think cover it is best. And definitely with vinegars, um, it is best to cover it because they're light sensitive. Uh, so when I do, um, uh, when I kraut cabbages or carrots or beets or Jerusalem artichokes or whatever I've got, um, yeah, if it's very soft, so the, okay. So there are so once you've added the salt, so you do your cabbage exactly the same way. You grate your cabbage or you chop it finely. Um, you sprinkle it with salt in the layers. You can get your hands in there and, and massage it. So the aim is to get this to spread the salt throughout. Um, or I've got a, um, a rolling pin with one handle missing, and I'll just pound it. So you want to you want to bruise the vegetables, and so by osmosis you want the salt to touch it like to touch all, all sides of it and then to draw the liquid out of it to create its own brine. And the good thing about pounding it is that it also gets rid of all the air bubbles from the bottom of your jar. You just got to make sure um, that you don't pound too hard that you break your crock or jar because you think, oh, that's not going to happen. I'm not doing it that hard. It will happen. <laughs> Especially if you're silly like me and one day I used a beer bottle and my favourite crock. Oh, I'll never make that mistake again. Um, okay, any other questions about kraut before we move on to lepico? You said Jerusalem artichokes. Do you just do the same thing? You do. You do. Salt? So Jerusalem artichokes, um, you can kraut it, not really on its own. It's better when mixed with other things. However, it does go quite slimy. The best thing that I, one of the best things that I do with Jerusalem artichokes is to pickle them. So you slice, you clean them, um, get rid of all the brown knobbly bits, get rid of all the dirt, slice them. Um, and then just put them in a brine, which is what we're just about to do now with a few things here. Um, so they go pretty quickly in our house, even though we have, if anyone who knows how they grow, you'll never get rid of them in your garden. And they're so, it, it's um, climate change food, it's drought hardy. Does yeah, the pickling so, reduce the gas effect? Yes, it does. So people who have had Jerusalem, people who have had Jerusalem artichokes, but people know what Jerusalem artichokes are. Um, it's in the sunflower family. Um, they're a tuber. They grow under the underground. They have these beautiful, tall stems with the little um, sunflowers on the top. Um, and you pull them up, and it's like, oh my god, there's just so many of them. What am I going to do with them all? Pickle them. Don't have to water them. <laughs> you don't have to water them. That's right. Um, so. People who have had them before know that they can cause um, irritable, they just, they're called fartichokes, yes. and it's the build-up of the gas. Um, so the, the inulin in them, the, it's the sugars in them that our bodies, we don't have the enzyme to digest them. But so lacto-fermenting them, and lacto doesn't mean um, milk, it means lactobacillus, which is the name of the bacteria that we're trying to court. Uh, so lacto um, fermenting them, whether you kraut them or pickle them, that will get rid of that, pre-digest them, and that will enable you to eat them without having a tummy upset. Yep. So you do need to um, ferment them for minimum three weeks, and that's the same with um, most krauts, apart from zucchini kraut, um, that three weeks is when um, they have the optimum, optimal bacteria in them, the microbes, that's when you just want to eat them because they've got the most here. Um, so. I thought that we would do some pickling and that we would do some, what I put out of our garden today, some carrots, some onions and some purslane. Is everybody familiar with purslane? Uh, it is a weed. Um, we have a whole row in our garden that is just naturalised. Um, it just comes up this time of year. Um, it is gold. So Michael Pollan, the food writer and food ad, um, activist and advocate for slow food and natural food, um, he just says this is, it, it's so full of omega-3s um, and it's just the best vegetable that you can eat. So generally I pluck the leaves um, and then I'll keep the stems, especially the big ones, um, and then I'll pickle them. But so this is the first time that I'm going to try pickling the whole thing. But because they're, it's a succulent um, and it, they're pretty hard, like if you have a feel, I mean, they're not, they're not 
so soft. It's sort of like a cucumber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so carrots. Again, they've been scrubbed, not peeled. There's a little bit of soil that's a little bit stubborn. I don't peel my vegetables. Um, we grow our food organically. If I was just buying conventionally grown, grown food, then I would probably peel this carrot. Well, I definitely would peel this carrot. Well, I wouldn't use it, but... <laughs> but if, you, if that's all you, you can do... Um, yeah. So you can pickle carrots whole. Um, I'm not going to. I'm just going to slice them. I just think it's just a little bit easier to eat. And if I'm putting out like a, um, a plough person's lunch with lots of different pickles and things like that, then it's just nicer if it's, if it's sliced. Okay, so... Um, Slice chopped carrot, and again you can grate it and you can make a carrot kraut. Um, carrot and ginger kraut, particularly good. Um, yeah, but in this case I'm going to pickle. Um, and onions, they're just sort of very small. If you're going to use, you can slice, if you've got large onions, you can just do the whole thing or just slice them. Um, so I'll just throw those in. Um, and just for the taste, I like to use garlic. Um, so I've just got, for a jar this size, well, it's sort of two and a half, maybe, garlic cloves or three. Depends what your family likes, what you like. Um, and uh, so if I have a crock, I'll put in maybe a whole hand of garlic. Um, and at the end, of, when I've finished all the pickles and I've kept all the brine, and I'll talk about what you can use as for brine in a second, um, but I'll keep all of the garlic and I'll stick it in some brine in a big jar in the fridge. Um, and if I'm making hummus or a soup or a stew, I'll just put some of that garlic in. And if you don't have fresh garlic, that's really great to use. Um, another, th um, this time of year um, is when I really start um, building up our um, medicinal ferments re in ready for winter. So peeled garlic in uh, honey, in cold, cold extracted honey, um, in a jar. You need to turn it every day for two weeks because the garlic will rise to the top. Again, you need to burp it to release that carbon dioxide. And by the end of those few weeks, the honey will be um, very, very liquidy because you'll have all the liquid from the garlic and it'll be really garlicky in taste. So fantastic just to have a teaspoon or in your tea or um, in salad dressings, particularly good. And then the garlic become really, really shriveled. Um, and if you just ha have one of those when you're feeling a little tickle in the back of your throat and it doesn't taste garlicky, it just sort of is this soft caramel honeyized garlic. It's really good. So definitely recommend that this time of year. Um, okay, so actually I think what I'll do is just stick to what I've done before successfully because I really want to eat this purslane, <laughs> the leaves, because they're just so good. Um, and I'm just going to stick some of these, just the purslane stems, in there. So I have a heap more. Do people, did everybody get a taste of the purslane? No? Okay. Uh, could you please grab that and just pass it? I might just keep the, that stem. Okay. Thank you. Um, and also the seeds of the purslane. They're very, very small black seeds, um, and if you can be bothered collecting them, um, you can use them instead of poppy seeds if you're baking. So we have so many different ferments in our house going at once. There's, Patrick has ones that are in his domain, I have ones that are in mine. Um, and it is really good to have diversity of ferments because diversity ferments equals diversity of microbes. And it's like if you're just going to have vegetables, you wouldn't just have carrots or you wouldn't just have broccoli, even though that, that's better than no vegetables at all. So it's really great to have vegetables of all different colours and fruits. Um, and also from not just from your soil, from other people's soil as well, because you're going to be deficient in some things and other people are going to be deficient in other things. So it's good to have diversity. Same with ferments. So it's really good to have a yogurt, a milk kefir going, a kombucha and pickles and beer and chocolate and coffee, of course. They are <laughs> you can't forget them. Um, okay, so I do have some pickled purslane stems. Um, they're probably not quite ready, but I thought that I'd bring some along for people to try. I feel free to just pass those around and stick your dirty fingers in there. <laughs> so people will tell you... Um, and there are charts you can find on the internet of all different 
um, ratios of brine to water to vegetables depending on what you are pickling. So if you're pickling harder, um, like carrots, you might use a different percentage brine than if you're going to do gherkins, for example. Um, I do the same no matter what, um, whether it's Jerusalem artichokes or gherkins or carrots or purslane or whatever, and it always, I just do the same recipe, the same, the same um, um, seeds and spices for everything, um, and it always works out fine, so I'm not going to mess with that. Um, and also, this, the pink lake salt is so good. I just... I just, no matter what I make, I think it's great. Um, okay, so my ratio is one tablespoon of brine, no, so one tablespoon of salt to two cups of water. We also have rainwater at home. Um, today I'm just using tap water because that's what's here. Um, that's fine. So. So this is one cup, so I'm just gonna do one cup and then, oops, and then um, just add another cup in, if it will allow me. So just stir it in. Some people use boil the water and then let it cool. With the salt in there, I just stir it in. Okay, so it's two, again, it's one cup, no, one tablespoon of salt to two cups of water. So, um, so here's my vegetables. It's got the garlic already in there. Um, and here I've got some um, bay leaves from our tree. Um, and I've got in here some, so for this amount, it's uh, just less than a tablespoon uh, altogether of um, black peppercorns, dill seeds, and mustard seeds, all combined, um, which I just did at home this morning. And my secret ingredient that is not very secret because I'm telling everybody, is um, lemon. This is dry, dehydrated lemon. I just, whenever we have a whole stash of them, I'll just dehydrate them in our glass house. Um, but I've just put two of those in. So in your glass? Yeah, you can use fresh lemon. Yep. So in your glass house? Well, have you got a like, yeah, we, greenhouse thing? Yes, there? we do. And yep. you can just dry your stuff? Yeah, or in a dehydrator or in a low oven or ha or just a, on or your trampoline rack or rack, however you want to dry your things. Can you do the whole of the slice of the Yes, yes, so just slice yeah, everything. Um, and I just feel like whatever, just the lemon just sort of adds a little bit of zing to it. It's really good. Um, and also, when you are pickling anything, uh, it's really good to put a leaf with tannin in it, um, which will just help help keep the crunch. So we have uh, grapevine, um, you can use horseradish, you can use oak leaves, you can use raspberry or blackberry leaves, um, oak leaves, or you can also use tea leaves. But if you're going to use so green tea or any sort of tannin tea, green tea, black tea, but if you are going to use tea leaves, um, it's really good to make a cup of tea first and then use the, the tea leaves, whether it's a tea bag or just the tea leaves straight. Because uh, I'm also going to use it as a follower, which is going to keep the solids under the liquid. Um, I've got three here. Yeah, I'd probably use two or three of this size vine leaves. So just on the top just to keep them. That's right. Or you can put them in the bottom or, yeah, one or two tea bags for this. I would just keep an eye on it, maybe a week like this, covered up and then with a the lid on um, and then I'd sort of monitor it and see if it needs burping and then stick it in the cellar or the fridge. No, burping is when you open the lid and release the carbon dioxide. No. Um, so just before we run out of time, I'll just talk about Mistress Tonic. Uh, so this was decanted from um, a bigger jar this morning. Um, so Mistress Tonic is also called, uh, if you Google uh, Master Tonic or Fire Cider, um, it'll be a recipe that this is based on, um, but I make it in our house and I'm not a master, I am the mistress. Um, hence mistress tonic. Uh, so this is homemade apple cider vinegar, um, in which has been steeped for minimum six weeks. This has been going for a couple of years. Um, this is um, ginger, I'll just say the list first and then if you need me to repeat it I will. So this is uh, ginger, turmeric, onion, garlic, horseradish, uh, dried orange peel, uh, cinnamon stick, bay leaf, peppercorns, um, uh, what else is in there, rosemary, uh, I 
think that's it in this one. Um, and yeah, topped up with apple cider vinegar. And then the aim is to keep it there, to drink it when you feel yourself getting a little bit unwell. Um, and then we did, I just keep topping it up with apple cider vinegar. And then when I, um, whenever, I was just saying to Meg yesterday, like when I'm grating ginger or turmeric and you get to that last little fibrous end, in it goes. Um, if there's any leftover, any of those things, garlic peel, onion peel, it just, I just put it in, I just keep it going. Um, and so this one's been going for a couple of years. And last year I finished one, I just thought, this has just been going too long. Again, it's been going for a couple of years. I just felt like the goodness had been sucked out of it. Um, so I spread half of it um, on dehydrator racks, dehydrated it, and then ground it in our coffee grinder. Um, and then this I use in breads and crackers and nothing goes to waste. <laughs> you can laugh, but... <laughs> um, so this is just, it's really remarkable. Even if you just sort of want to put a little bit in warm water, it's just... It's gold. And the other half, um, I just mixed with olive oil. And again, it just goes on the side. If you're going to have it on bread or soup or stew or just on its own, it's really delicious. So I'm happy to pass these around as well. Could you run through the list again? Please? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't think you're going to get away with it that easily. Uh, so it's got in it ginger and turmeric. Yeah. Um, onion, garlic. Yep. And you can chop it, you can not chop it. I prefer to chop it because then when I get to this stage, it's just much easier that it's already pre-chopped. Um, yeah, so onion, garlic, horseradish. You can do the leaves and the root. Um, this has just got the root in it, again, finely chopped. Um, uh, cinnamon stick. And for this stage, I'll take, that, take the cinnamon stick out. Um, so cinnamon stick, rosemary, dried orange peel. So dried orange peel, because we've got a wood fire um, and we grow our own citrus, so when we've eaten the flesh, we'll slice, slice the orange peel and stick it on top of our wood stove. Um, we've got a little drying rack above it. Um, so if one accidentally drops down onto the fire and burns, or sort of goes a bit black, that'll become a fire starter for the next morning. And if it dries out and just goes really crispy, we'll um, save up a whole lot and put it in our coffee grinder or food processor and just make a powder of it and that goes in fruit breads when we make fruit bread. So that just has that and dried fruit that we use in Patrick's sourdough. Amazing! <laughs> so if you slowly, we ferment our bread for, for 24 hours. So it's a really slow ferment. We also do the high hydration method, so it's really wet. We just put it in the, the um, we call it zhuzhing, but it's like stretching and pulling. So we stretch and pull it over that 24 hours. Whenever we remember, it sits in our kitchen in a, in a bowl with a cloth over it. Whoever walks past it, oh yeah, let's let's use the bread. So we shoot it and then we put in the tins and again, we just leave it for a few hours to rise. Uh, I, the question was, do I do kombucha? I don't do kombucha. Um, I make jun. Uh, jun is in the same family as kombucha. I don't. I have a rule that I won't buy sugar or anything with sugar in it, processed sugar. Um, so therefore, I don't want to make kombucha. But I make jun, and jun uses green tea and honey. So Does it go I do fizzy. Yes, it goes fizzy. Yeah. yeah, Just naturally, like you don't need to do anything. No, no. I mean, you have to feed it. Yeah. Yeah. And if anybody's passing through Dalesford, um, I'm happy to share a jun scoby. So I think you can train your um, your scoby, is everybody familiar with that word? Yeah, sort of the mother that sits on top. Um, and scoby stands for um, uh, symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast, so which is the mother. So th the mother that sits on the top, um, you can train jun and kombucha mothers to ferment other things, um, but then they like to go back to what they naturally eat, you know, every five or six times, and then you can train them to, to do other things, to eat other things. Um, so I run a free monthly fermenting group in Dalesford. We're called Culture Club. Um, no one laughed. <laughs> um, if people want information, um, I run it through the Hepburn Relocalisation Network, which is like our version of the transition town. Um, so if you go to relocaliseheppern.blogspot.com, that's where I put all the information. Um, and Sandor Cats came out a couple of years ago. We also had um, uh, uh, David Asher, the natural fermenting guy. We have lots of really fantastic workshops. Um, we have all local people who specialise in different things and sometimes people who just try thing a things a couple of times. I've got some friends who make um, gluten-free sourdough 
very successfully, so I've encouraged them and they're going to come along in a couple of months and teach how to do that. Uh, so the, I run Culture Club today, the first Saturday of every month. First Saturday. Yeah. And so sometimes it's like this where people just demonstrate things. Um, we also tee up with local farmers, so we have community pickling days and community crouting and kimchi making days where they grow us the produce and then people come along and they bring it. We just have in our um, local Dalesford Town Hall, we have it. We had recently um, uh, a community pickling day and we had about 85 people come along and it was just so joyous. It was really, really great. And everybody just, you know, I send out a list of ingredients and a list of things to bring along and people just yeah, come and collectively learn and feed our microbes. Yeah. Usually, oh, that's what I want to talk about, things you can do with brine. Um, so things that I do with brine, um, make crackers, um, stick it in soups and stews, uh, you can pickle eggs in it. Um, so if you hard boil an egg, peel it and then stick it in brine and then in the fridge for 10 days and then after that week to 10 days you just sort of slice them and particularly if you've um, done uh, beetroot, uh, you've got a beetroot brine which is all pink and then the whites go pink and then the yellow stays yellow and they're so beautiful and very fancy looking. <laughs> We have so much brine in our house. I never have that problem. Uh, maybe if I did have that problem, I think I would just drink it. I've also had very low blood pressure, so I need to have a lot of salty foods and a lot of liquid, so brine is both those things at once. If you've got high blood pressure, um, Hawthorne berries are out at the moment. And on our website, on our YouTube channel, Artist is Family YouTube, you'll find a recipe to convert very inedible or undesirable hawthorn ber berries into very desirable fruit jerky. Uh, good for kids to chew on. Um, not great if you've got extremely low blood pressure, but it is a um, heart stabiliser if you've got um, high blood pressure, but it's also an awesome source of vitamin C. Um, I call it sun-fermented. Um, when you make fruit leathers, it's sun fermenting. When you um, make the sauerkraut or the zucchini, you want to, can you put like dandelions and yeah. thistle? Absolutely. And thistle roots are really great. Okay. Yeah. And, and people do the Is it okay to just let them dehydrate in the sun and then just. So they say with herbs and teas not in the sun. Right. So in a warm place. So I will tend to, if I've got racks of things in our glass house, I'll put them at the bottom where they don't get direct sunlight, but they still have the heat. If, if could the, you just hang them in the house? You could, exactly, in a, yeah. in a shady spot. Exactly. So you can, you can use dandelion roots all year round, even if the plant's flowering, but with thistle roots, they go really woody. Yeah. So winter and into spring, um, sometimes at this time of year you'll find a thistle that hasn't produced a flower head, but as soon as it starts to produce, it'll just send the taproot woody. But thistle roots are a remarkable source of food right. everywhere. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Really good mucilaginous, yeah. really good peeled, um, for peeled the gut. Raw or pickled. Most of our wild foods, if you if you're not if you're new to the idea of weeds, weeds are our ancestral medicine, our ancestral bush tucker for non-indigenous Australians. And get fall in love with them. Stop poisoning them <laughs> while they outcompete for our veggies, so we don't need them there. If you've got growing vegetables, don't pull your weeds out and just throw them away unless you're giving them to your chooks or, or some other um, animal system. Um, but make a weed tea, so an anaerobic compost of your weeds. Make a weed tea, brew it for, um, uh, ferment it for two weeks, it'll go quite manky. Make a concentrate of about uh, one part weed tea to 20 parts water and put it back on the bed because it's those pioneer species that are replacing the trauma of the soil, the, the nutrients and things that have been ripped out and the soil exposed in gardening or agriculture. Um, it's biodynamic practice to return those trace elements, nutrients, minerals via the weeds back into the soil via a fermented weed tea. It's very low tech and it mitigates the desire for more weeds to go to that area. That's what I found anecdotally. Um, it's a great sort of fertilizer.